Hi there, and thank you for tuning in to yet another episode of Democracy on Your Threat. I am Vanelda Harris, and with me today is Bishop Juan Ejo. Bishop, welcome to the program. And today we will be discussing issues, as you know, giving you an update on what is going on with Guyana's electoral process, how far GCOM has come with making their decisions and getting the recount on the way. So Bishop, the first thing I want, I want us to talk about is um, as the viewers know, on my last program, we, I updated you that the GCOM chair, she was supposed to give her decision on Friday, but instead we got an ambiguous email and that did not clarify much of the critical issues that we want answered for the recount to get started, such as dates of completion, of commencement, and so forth. But what we know happened over the weekend was that the GCOM chair instead she reached out to the National Coronavirus Task Force and the head of that task force is an APNO AFC political figure, as you all know, the former Prime Minister Moses Nagamutu. And we cannot possibly expect one like Moses Nagamutu to be impartial when giving advice regarding anything in the electoral process, especially when we would have seen blatant attempts in front of the eyes of the international observers and the entire nation to commit electoral fraud and rig the elections in favor of the APNU AFC. So uh, the recent update that we got is that President Granger would have made a different decision and uh, that is to relax the curfew. We heard Moses Nagamutu asking for the curfew to be applied strictly to the recount and to have the international observers who come to Guyana be quarantined for 14 days, which is absolutely ridiculous as the Guyanese people are waiting for the elections results to be declared transparently and credibly and for the electoral process to come to an end. So Bishop, what are your comments? Well, Vanella, let me take the opportunity to thank you for having me on your program. And secondly, to greet our Guyanese and other viewers that will view this program worldwide. The issue remains the same. The tactic or the narrative is what keeps changing. The issue is that you have a government who has lost an election and they are refusing to demit office. The narrative that is now current is that Mr. Granger would like to be conveyed or displayed before the world as a benevolent dictator. He's already a dictator, but he wants to show he's benevolent. So you set your prime minister up to do your dirty work, the PPPC and several other stakeholders, including leaders of the smaller parties that contested the elections, lambasted, ridiculed, boreholes, exposed the duplicity, the wickedness of the executive exercising control over a constitutional body. Vanilla, I chaired a constitutional body 2003 to 2011, the Ethnic Relations Commission. And I can tell you not once in the life and existence of that commission under my chairmanship, we ever sought permission from the executive to do anything that we were doing nor at any time did the executive attempted to give instructions to us to determine how we work, when we work, who we talk to, when we talk to them, and for how long. So when I saw the chairperson of GCOM, Madam Claudette Singh, 
writing Moses Nagamoto, I knew it was a step in the wrong direction. Moses Nagamoto, Walter Lawrence, Joseph Harmon, and all the other players in that COVID-19 task force, they have one thing in common. They don't want to demit office. They are scared of being out of government because of their corruption, their mismanagement, their maladministration, their sheer evil that was done before the no confidence motion, after the successful passage of the no confidence motion, and more so since March 2nd, 2020. They know that there are serious implications for them. So I was not surprised when Moses Nagamoto used his newspaper column to publicly declare his political propaganda that I've got power and I'm in control and if you don't want 156 to wait 156 days to the recount there are things that I can do I will use my position as head of the COVID-19 task force to frustrate international observers because when he said to be quarantined in a government institution for 14 days was tantamount to telling international observers we don't want you here because he fully well know no international observer will come and be quarantined in a government institution. You would have seen the pictures and the comments that came out of the 19 persons who were quarantined by the government when they came from Barbados at Camp Mandawini. The conditions of the toilet and all the rest of it and the Huna Hall that we had. One person even moved to court to see if he could get the court to release him from that form of detention as he called it because that's not being quarantined just for the sake of the public health. It's almost like a punishment, a prison. So that was one. They were trying their utmost to frustrate international observers from being present. And secondly, having won, having lost the battle of delay, 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 delay. And with the chairman saying, I would agree to up to 10 workstations, they figured that if they shortened the working hours, they could almost get back to their 156 days or six months. Hopefully that by then, there will be some sense of normalcy again in them being in government. People will get accustomed to them being in government and then the masses of the people will probably say, well then let's start buying David Hines's uh, narrative of inclusive government or we can uh, we can buy um, Gary Best. All of them, of course, beneficiaries of the largest and perks of the APNU for unity government and to seek to destroy the democratic will of the Guyanese people, which is to declare credible election results so that we can know who the Guyanese people elected to be their next president and to form their next government. Now, I've realized that today there is some information in the media that President Granger has relaxed the, uh, the five o'clock cutoff period um, for the recount and he has said that the observers, once they are tested, they can come, which was the logical way. If you are concerned about the health of the nation, ensure that those who are coming are not carriers of the virus. And the way to do that is by way of testing. But even the president himself is continuing with the charade of the delay of the days to the count by basically saying you can move from five to six, but you must start at eight o'clock. So while Moses Nagamuntu said you could start at six and go to five, the president says you can move from eight to six. Now, who gave the president a member of the executive? Who gave Moses Nagamutu, well, a, a former member of the executive, the power to dictate to a constitutional body what hours they can work? Listen to this. Essential services in that public health order 
that was issued under the public health ordinance could operate 24 hours. Security. So a security guard, a police officer, the fire department, nurses, doctors could operate for 24 hours. But the biggest issue in Guyana, which is more essential than any one of the things that are going on, the future of this country, the soul of this country is, is, is in pain and agony. We are at the edge of being ripped apart if we are not properly healed and dealt with by some amount of credibility in what comes out of that GCOM process. And the executive, a beneficiary of the fraudulent declarations by Mingo, are trying to dictate, I don't want you working beyond seven o'clock, six o'clock, because that means that the results will be made known probably in 12, 14 days. We would like it to be dragged out and dragged out. And there's a design. There's a design why they want it to be dragged out. They want frustration to kick in so that the people must be able to turn on the opposition and start saying, this thing not done. You'll form this government of national unity or you'll get some political talks or you'll get some accommodation. That is their intention. They know they have lost the election. They don't want to give up government. And they're now trying to create an environment that the populace must want to come and force the opposition into a compromise and that they must be able to remain in government with this uh, fiddling and the machinations of the David Hines and the Gary Best and the Rickford Burks. And I know I noticed today Hamilton Green has joined in the fray with a letter. Uh, all of them beneficiaries of this illegality that is taking place for their own continual existence. All of them being selfish, wanting to have power for the sake of personal gain and not for the good of Guyana, pushing that narrative. So the narrative is what keeps being changed, but the end result is the longer we stay in power, the, be the better for us because of the personal benefits that they are enjoying. But we, the people of Guyana, we, the People's Progressive Party Civic, must not allow that to happen. And Vanella, I think this would be an appropriate time while we are having this discussion for me to publicly commend our presidential candidate, or I may dare say our president in waiting, um, Dr. Irfan Ali, for his address to the nation today, which brings to the people of Guyana the assurances that the opposition is not, or I should say the PPPC, we have to get rid of opposition, we have won an election and, and, and we will not allow ourselves to be cheated out of that. The PPPC is not just merely sitting, hoping and waiting on a recount. Dr. Irfan Ali carefully articulated for the public today the intent, the thought process, and the work that is being put in to ensure that once the recount is completed and the PPPC takes government, these are things that could become actionable immediately to ensure that our economy is saved, the health of our people are safeguarded, the future of Guyana is not derailed. So when it has to do with fighting the COVID-19 pandemic, when it has to do with bringing relief to people who are affected as a result of that, small businesses, uh, self-employed persons, those who are quarantined at home, uh, co consultation with various stakeholders, ensuring the security of our borders and the security, internal security of the state. These were all matters that were addressed by him this afternoon. And I would want to publicly commend him for leading the charge and giving hope to our people and letting our people know it might have been 45, 47, maybe going to 50 days and beyond before we can get a final declaration. But don't lose faith. The people you voted for, the people that you elected, understand the nature of the beasts that we are dealing with, this undemocratic 
totalitarian dictatorial PNC regime that is masquerading as APNU AFC because one would have thought that Nagamutu would have behaved in a more responsible manner a man who said he fought for democracy with Cherry Jagan now it is clear that while Cherry Jagan was fighting for democracy and the likes of Nagamutu was with him Nagamutu was really fighting for himself a, a, a power base that he could benefit from whether it's democratic or not he doesn't care once he is a beneficiary because if you stood with Cherry Jagan and you stood for democratic principles you would have been the one to speak out against the current behavior the, the behavior of the current regime and made a difference the same applies to Ramjatan the same applies to Katiyus who said you know well we are the third force and we are making a difference but they are dead they are non-existent they are just merely beneficiaries of the perks of office and they are only concerned about themselves Guyana deserves a government that will take care of the people and that is one reason why the AP and UAFC could not have put out a manifesto because they couldn't tell the people what they would do for them because they just wanted to stay in power for power's sake but the PPPC we went to the people all across this country I traveled throughout Guyana every region talking to people in public meetings appearing on television shows our various candidates our presidential candidate the general secretary and we brought our message telling people if you elect us this is what we will do today Dr. Irfan Ali by his address to the nation went back and said we're gonna hold faith with the people of Guyana we're gonna do what is necessary to ensure that your lives are better and so th that, that is where we are and I am using this program tonight Vanella to say to Madam Justice Claudette Singh and all the commissioners of GCOM who took the oath of office to be commissioners of the Ghana Elections Commission you are an independent statutory body the Constitution says you're not subject to the direction and the control of any other of any other the president the public health ministry cannot determine when GCOM works you are an essential service to this nation why if, if the COVID-19 is, is a concern why can't we work two shifts you have a shift that work until 5 o'clock you bring in the people you sanitize the place you wipe it out you make sure you use your bleach you spray it out and all the rest of it and you start another shift shift by seven o'clock and you go until what midnight or one o'clock and you get everybody home and you keep it going the country should not be waiting on this oh what was the difficulty as well if this is the case why can't we have more counting stations and if you don't want just one location why not use two locations so there, there are a lot of considerations that GCOM of itself must start behaving like they are constitutionally empowered to deliver free, fair, and transparent elections and they're not there being subject to the whims and fancies of Granger and his cabal because the cabal belongs to Granger. I notice people are trying to separate him from the cabal. But what we what is very surprising and disappointing is that the chair of GCOM was a former justice of appeal and so she of all persons should understand how important it is to get the electoral process completed and she should also have some understanding of the Constitution and it's it's very disappointing that the GCOM chair, I believe that she's just playing games too because we know by now, based on all that we've seen occurred since March 2nd when APNU realized that they lost the elections, is them just pulling at straws because they know that it is time for them to go. The people voted them out and they elected the People's Progressive Party Civic, a party that they know 
will fight for them and will serve the people. Over the past five years, what has happened, we understand that the people have, have suffered and suffered tremendously. Business people would have been severely taxed and the people voted for change. So it is very disappointing that the chairwoman of GCOM, Justice Carter Singh, is acting as though she does not understand what really needs to be done. And like you said, GCOM is a constitutional body and does not need to approach any other body for directives on the, on the way forward as to how the electoral process should be conducted. What GCOM could have done is instead come up with their own guidelines. They have the commissioners from the PVP, the commissioners from the, the government, the secretariat and the chairwoman come, come together and discuss, come up with guidelines as to how we can fight the coronavirus pandemic while ensuring that the electoral process is credibly and transparently completed. Now, the next thing I want us to talk about is the Ocean View International Hotel. I know for those viewers who do not know, Bishop Juan Agil has worked in the Ministry of Finance under the People's Progressive Party Civic Administration. And so Bishop, I want you to explain what is really going on and give the viewers some insight as to that corrupt deal that we're seeing going on in front of all of our eyes with the $1 billion refurbished property at Ocean View International Hotel for under the guise actually of making it a facility for coronavirus. Vanilla, the Ocean View COVID-19 hospital project, as I might want to describe it, is just the occasion for the continuation of the modus operandi of the PNC. Grab as much as you can get. The Sussex Street bond of the $14 million a month expenditure 12.5 million in rent and then they have to pay all the amenities when you come up to about 14 million dollars a month was just the occasion for the siphoning off of money so you spent 25 million dollars on Sussex Street as a two months advance to rent the facility the person you rented from did not own the facility at the time so they took the two months advance and bought the property for 25 million and then rented to you for 12.5 million dollars a month so hundreds of millions of taxpayers money went through a corrupt pipeline and the person who got that deal is a person who was photographed seated in a PNC Congress at Congress Place. So, you know the links. That kind of a behavior continued with a hard act Singh out of New York who got a pharmaceutical contract for billions of dollars when he had never done anything like that for fertilizers. And, and that kind of a trend continued so the, the ocean view is just one in a series of things that are created to have large expenditure so that you can be able to cream off and fatten your pockets in one of the most corrupt and bizarre ways that you can think about. Now, the ocean view hotel situation. There are a number of questions that has to be asked. Yes, if the PPPC had taken over government somewhere around March 7th or 8th, the latest, we had an elections on the 2nd and I'm given a week. We would have been faced with the same dilemma of having to create space adequate environment for the treatment of our citizens who could be 
affected by COVID-19. So we would have had to have certain considerations. It's a national emergency. I heard the PS, or I read in the media, the PS saying that she made a call to the owners of Prashad Hospital, which is a facility that could have been used. And she was getting the royal run around. So she made a call to whoever is the owners of Ocean View. And first word, they said yes. So you have a hospital, Prashant Hospital Complex, which could have been minimal, minimal amount of expenditure be brought up to standard because I'm told it's not been used very much these days. It has its own operating theater. It already has an ICU. It has a high dependency unit. It has its beds. It has the whole layout of an hospital. Because you didn't want to make two more calls. You called somebody who said yes right away. But if a government, if I was sitting in cabinet and Dr. Irfan Ali was president, I'm sure that Dr. Ali would be saying to us in cabinet, let us find a facility that don't only benefit Guyana on the short term, but benefit Guyana on the long term. So whether, could we find space at the West Demerara Hospital to move some things around, bring it up to speed, take a couple of weeks, and we know when we're finished, we have upgraded a regional hospital so long after COVID-19, we have a facility to use. Is there a government facility that is not in use or even if it is in use we could slip those occupants out and use it in a manner that when it is finished the government has benefits so it's called value for money now the ocean view international conference center the last known owner was mr jacob rambaran mr jacob rambaran in 2015 to cut full page ads in the various dailies and endorse the APNU AFC. So you know that Mr. Rambaran is a supporter, possibly a financer, and an enthusiast of the coalition government. So he will say yes. Now, if you were forced to go that way, transparency would have meant that you would have made public disclosure ahead of time. We are faced with a national emergency. We are looking for a facility that we could have a dedicated COVID-19 hospital. And we are asking for persons who are interested in providing facilities to make it known. No. No time for that. If I call Prashad Hospital twice and they don't answer, well, I'm hearing discussion about the newly renovated government doctor's flats not far away from the Georgetown Hospital. They forego that. Now, the Minister of Finance proudly sits on an interview with the DPI and announced that to retrofit the Ocean View International Hotel and Conference Center, it would be more than a billion dollars. That's more than five million US dollars. What is the rental? What is the monthly rental? Did the government compulsory acquired Ocean View International Hotel and Conference Center. And if they compulsory acquired it, at what cost? If it was not compulsory acquired, what is the rental? Why aren't we told who's the real owner? Because we are hearing that the Ocean View International Hotel is in receivership. A particular accounting firm, auditing firm, is being named as the receiver manager 
at this particular time. Why not come straight with the Guyanese people and make these things known? Then the contractors who were assembled to do the work, what was the process? Was there an estimate from an engineer of what it would cost before we start or are we making it up as we go along? Worse, is there a contract sum? Was this contract approved by the tender board? So we're talking here about the continual squander mania. The continual squander mania of public funds. We heard that they're using the National Sports Hall, the National Gymnasium. I really don't understand. Well, I should say, not that I don't understand, I can't accept the thinking of this coalition government because I understand that their decisions is about what they could make out of it. They are a bunch of hustlers. That's what they are. I heard the other day the General Secretary of the PPPC, Dr. Barajandio, referring to them as the criminal cabal. And I don't think that there is a term that could more aptly describe this kind of behavior because it's criminal. You're using the distress. You're using the anxiety of the people, COVID-19. And then you just forge it and says, let's use that and make a hustle. And this is what is disgusting. And that is why we probably need Claudette Singh and the GCOM commissioners to move with alacrity. Let's get the count done and get a legitimate government in place and salvage this country from being pilfered and, and destroyed. Because we don't know what's going to happen when we get there. The public purse might be just ruined. Zero. We've already seen that the gold reserves have moved from 15 billion to just 600 million, under $1 billion. We've already seen that. We know places like the Guyana Forestry Commission, an extra budgetary agency that had its own fund. Staff of the Guyana Forestry Commission have not been paid for last month as yet. This is the way this cabal has run the country. And the, the disgusting thing about it is that they are shameless about what they do and they can find people in the society who will actually articulate positions to support this kind of lawlessness and illegality and to make you who are speaking up for truth feel like you're the, you're, you're the villain. You're the bad guy here. You, you, you don't know what you're talking. The people got to do what they got to do. We got to bring this to an end. This nonsense must stop. So Ocean View. <laughs> you know what they could have done? They could have invited the Auditor General. To actually audit what is going on there. While it is taking place. If they wanted transparency. Do you know during the 2005 floods, Barajagnio was president, it was a national emergency, and we were procuring supplies to uh, distribute to people across the country for flood relief. Do you know that the Auditor General's office was physically present at the central places? When the trucks came in with goods to check it off, when the trucks were leaving to go to various to check it off, because the whole exercise, it's an emergency, you're trying to get things from different places. The Auditor General's office was physically present, auditing the entire process while it was taking place to ensure transparency. But when you have a government who just uses the occasion for the hustle because they're a bunch of hustlers. I'm very disappointed in what I'm seeing. You know, what would, what would the Ocean View sell for if it, if it had to be sold? What would it 
be solved. If you have to spend a billion dollars to do over roof, tiles, walls, everything, you're building a new hotel. You're building a new ho and you're building a hotel in an uh, or a hospital, they want to call it now, in an area where it was closed down because when the floods come over the seawall, the salt water has been getting into the hotel. What is going to stop that from taking place? Where are all the fancy engineers who come out in defense of the AP and new AFC government as it relates to this project? Why are we not hearing the big mouths and the long letters and all the rest of it from the engineers who claim that they're so highly intelligent and all the rest of it, but what is going on there? But you know why there's silence? Because everybody's pocket is full there. Too many people who have been compromised by this APNU AFC government, social bribery, perks, positions, national awards, and all the, and silence them that now they can't speak. Wrong is taking place and they prefer to be silent. So it's just a matter of time. We will have to investigate that. Uh, and I'm saying, and I want it to be clear in case you have those out there who are probably saying that uh, we want people to die, we don't want people to get proper treatment. That's not the point. Even if you wanted to go for that project, the transparency could have eased the frustration and the anxiety that currently exists because you could have come clean with the people of Ghana. First of all, the state who's the owners? Well, if you if the, if you one billion dollars of taxpayers' money is being spent on a facility, Winston Jordan could have simply said, "Who are the current owners of the Ocean View Hotel, and what is the monthly rental?" What's so wrong with that? So I rest my case now. But what we what is, has been proven actually is that definitely this cabal is criminal i mean we we've seen evidence of the corruption we've seen them trying to steal an entire election in front of the world and so we we cannot expect much more fr from them i mean the entire world all of the international observers have seen them in action and so we know what they're about we know about their incompetence we know about their corruption and we know that they're just they're trying to hang on to power why because they are aware that they lost the 2020 elections by a landslide by a huge gap the pvpc won these elections and they're just clutching at straws every day trying to delay in collusion with officials from the Guyana Elections Commission to try to stay in there as long as, as possible. And as I have said before, if they really believe that they won these elections, don't you think that they would have wanted Granger sworn in? Why would they want to wait almost half a year to have their government deemed legitimate? Why would you want to sit around in there as an illegitimate government? Well, there, there are many um, things that you could think about. Number one, the PPPC made a bold move in placing for public scrutiny and public view the statements of poll of Region 4 as well as the tally sheets. We challenge GCOM and we challenge the PNC up new AFC to put up theirs. I did a program with you, Vanilla, where I explained to the people of Ghana, apart from Mingo, Lowen Field has copies of every statement of poll for all 2,339 polling stations they had across this country. He could sit down in front of Claudette Singh and show her the PPP loss or the PPP won, the PNC loss or the PPP won, and he could then publish those statements of poll for the whole world to see, and a declaration could be made. But I said not so long ago, after Mr. 
Lowenfield brought his 156-day plan to GCOM that the Siamese triplet, the three GCOM commissioners, Lowenfield and his secretariat staff, and the government seems to be in agreement on all matters as it relates to elections 2020. They are joined, they, 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 they are connected. You have betrayed the trust of the Guyanese people by lying to them about the first money we got from oil, ExxonMobil. And you told us you didn't get any money. And then you got the money and the money was to be used for, to fight Venezuela. We had a similar reoccurrence a few days ago. You signed a contract with JJ and B. and B law firm. And then you didn't sign a contract. It is the government of Guyana with Joseph Harmon as the principal contact. And then you have the president who says it's not his government, uh, it's, it's not him. The character of the government is on open display. Harmon comes out on Durban Park. Not one cent of taxpayers' money is being spent to build Durban Park. And this was said in Parliament. Where the Hansard records everything that you say and preserves it. You can't say you make a mistake. This is Parliament. In answer to Gail to share a joint budget debate. Not one said this is friends and supporters of the APNU that is funding Durban Park. Then the Auditor General tells us over 1.3 billion taxpayers' dollars. And counting because every time Durban Park is used money has to be spent to spruce it up clean it up get rid of the wood ants put in back lights it's a continual project once it's being used you got to spend money on it and 607 million of that cannot be accounted for there are no receipts so a project taxpayers money you get a hustle now I brought all of that up to make the point the modus operandi of the APNU AFC is that they cannot be truthful. It's not just that they don't tell the truth. It is almost impossible for them to tell the truth. You, things come out as rumors and then you hear different stories. Is Carl Greenwich still employed by the government or not? Was he dismissed or not? Karen Cummins says he's not on the list that the president had to be retained. He was not on that list. Which list? Um, Harmon comes out and says, well, he wasn't fired, now he wasn't terminated. What do you take Guyanese for? Idiots? The only idiots Guyana presently have is that small group of people who try to steal an election in front of the whole world and believe that nobody was seeing and still persist in going in that way you know what is their plan right now to frustrate Guyanese to frustrate the recount process do everything that is possible to drag it out frustrate it get you turned off get you angry to the point where either they could come and say well the elections must be squashed it must be null and void, and we got to do over new elections. Who wants to do over new elections with that elections commission? So, the moment you come to squashing an election and doing over an election, they buy themselves more time, three to four years, because you got to get a new chairman, you got to reform GCOM, you got to get a new elections officer, then they're going to want to have a new list. And they, to get that new list, you will have to do house to house registration. This is a nature of that group. Even the grandchildren 
are seeing it, but they can't see it. They can't see it. It is their nature. And you know what is bothersome to me? Is that these people do it smiling and talking about God. And they have their supporters quoting scriptures to represent evil and wickedness. And some are even praying and pronouncing blessings and calling people who are speaking the truth evil and the devil and haters. It bothers me that our small, beautiful Guyana have come to such a state that we could witness such ludicrous behavior and real. I'm running out of words to describe this cabal. But the truth about it, the longest rope do come to an end. Those votes in those 13 containers will be counted. They will be tabulated accurately in the presence of persons who are entitled to witness it. It has to be transparent. The numbers will add up and we will know who won the March 2nd, 2020 elections. A PPPC government will be installed. Dr. Irfan Ali today spoke about our approach of inclusiveness, consultation, getting everybody on board, working for the benefit of all, and that's what we will do. Not just for five or ten or fifteen people. Some persons have on their list is about thirty in the rigging cabal, about thirty persons in the rigging cabal. You have noticed some of the ex-members of the government you can't see or hear from them. They have totally disappeared. The loud mouths and the boom outs and everybody, they have gone, disappeared. Because they know what is coming. They have to account for the wealth that they have gotten, that they haven't declared to the Integrity Commission. They have to bring an account of how they were able to own the properties in Guyana and out of Guyana. So they are nervous. But you cannot rape a country and then behave the way you are behaving. This is disgusting and we got to continue to stand up against it. And you know, for, to all of the Guyanese who are saying that all the PPPC has been doing is talk, 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 talk. Well, I want you to go through the history of from since the No Confidence Motion to now. A lot of the wicked things that the government, GCOM, the president, Nagamuktu, and everybody was trying to do, Vala Lawrence and all of them, is because of the talk of the PPPC, they had to change their minds. Vala Lawrence had, in order for you to get tested for COVID, she had to get permission, and it had to go through, through her. It was because of the talk of leading members of the PPPC in, the, in our own stakeholders forum that, that we have formed, that she had to surrender and now said private hospitals could do testing. It is talk that brought us there. You could remember when GCOM wanted to uh, continue with their thing about if you don't have an ID card, your name won't come off the list. We came out on television, we protested, they had to abandon that. You recall that when they wanted to reduce the amount of uh, polling stations at Monrepo and at Lusignan and all the rest of it, we came out and we spoke, they ended up visiting and they had to restore those polling um, stations. What I'm trying to tell you is that we can't lose hope with the kind of struggle that is being fought by our general secretary, our presidential candidate, and other leaders of the PPPC, whether it's in the left columns, whether it's on television, whether it's on Facebook, because when we mount the pressure, they have to backpedal. They have to backpedal. Because we are taking the people with us. And the power of the people is always greater than the people in power. The power of the people is always greater than the people in power. And so we, we, we got to stay in the struggle. We, we, we fought the issue of five counting stations and 
156 days, it had to come down. We can get a final position soon, but it's not going to be 156 days, it's not going to be 100 days. Over the weekend, we fought Nagamoto's nonsense about uh, curfew and quarantine. The president this morning had to backpedal and said, nobody with the quarantine, nobody with the curfew issue. So don't believe that the PPPC and their leaders are not making inroads into this evil plot. Every time we do a program like this, we write on our in the newspapers, we go to Facebook, we are mounting the pressure and we are exposing the wickedness of this cabal and we are calling the international forces to recognize what is happening and we are making inroads. So we can't give up and behave like if we are a defeated people because we are not a defeated people. We will get through this and we will form the next government. And what we're doing every day, as you said, whether it's in the newspaper, whether it's on Facebook, whether it's on TV, is we're fighting for you. We're fighting for your will to be represented, the people's will to be respected. Because you would have come out on March 2nd and voted and elected a government that you believe could serve you, that you chose to serve you. And now you have this handful of criminals, I say diplomatic criminals, trying to stay in government illegally but they will have to get out eventually bishop they have to go because the people voted them out and when we get to counting those ballots in those boxes we are going to see who the liars are who have been trying to deceive the people of this nation and you will see for yourselves that the apnu afc is made up of a bunch of crooks people trying to hang on to power illegally and trying to manipulate the Guyanese people and use them for their own personal gain. Wait, Ovenello, what is interesting? You have the likes of these minions and surrogates of James Bond et al. Who jumped to Facebook to defend everything? When we spoke about this law firm and the dossier that was sent out, James Bond jumped and defend, we got to this and we got to do that and Harmon was right and blah, blah, blah. The president comes down and shut him down and then he turns around and says, yes, Mr. President, we agree with you. The very next day. The next. These guys have no sense. Their leaders are throwing them under the bus and according to the critic, park the bus and throw away the key. And they're continuing. Mingo did his rig sheet. Some people call it a spreadsheet, a rig sheet. They came out in defense of Mingo. The Chief Justice says, oh no, Mr. Mingo, the representation of the people's access, you got to use the statements of poll. They were thrown under the bus and left hanging. Mingo went back now from red sheet to bed sheet. We went back to court with the contempt of court proceedings. Granger calls in Mayor Motley and Caricom to rescue him because they're now in hot water. Yuli tomorrow comes out and challenges that. The court says the recount will go on. The recount will go on. The injunction stopping the recount a discharge. They jump to television again. They always wanted a recount. You could imagine people in the PNC went to, te to Facebook to say they always wanted a recount. The same people who are trying to block the recount. And then they start saying, I hope the PPP could live with what will come out of those boxes where the recount happens. But we could live with it. Why don't we get it counted in 10 days? Why do you want it to be counted in 156 days? Why do you want to quarantine um, the observers when they come? Why do you want people to stop working at 5 o'clock in the afternoon? The PPP could live with the results of those ballot boxes. I don't understand the confusion fusion that exists in the thought process of these I don't know what to call them well, Bishop before we wrap up the program I mean I want you to touch on shared governance because what we've been hearing after the APNU AFC realized that they lost these elections 
And then all of a sudden, we started to hear them calling for shared governance. And nowhere in their manifesto, nowhere during campaigning, did we ever hear any talks of shared governance. But suddenly, after March 2nd, elections being held, we suddenly started to hear the narrative of having shared governance. Well, the only time the PNC raises the issue of shared governance is when they're in opposition. So from the time David Hines and others at all, and all those who are writing about shared governance, it is because they were convinced that the PNC lost government. The PNC does not discuss shared governance unless they are in the opposition. It is when they believe that they can be in control of everything, then they would like to be a part. From 2015, to 220 while they were in government no discussion no display of interest that they would like to incorporate the opposition as part of governance structures in the country they did everything by themselves even the one mechanism that is constitutionally enshrined to ensure consultation and agreement that the selecting of the chairperson of DCOM, the president, the ultimate leader of the PNC and the APNU, through that through the window, rejected 18 people and he put in his man. If we didn't go to the Caribbean Court of Justice to get that overturned, Patterson would have been there to continue his rigging machine that he set up when he got there. So, the talk of the PNC acts. I don't bother with the WPA. David Hines is PNC. He has so loved WPA a long time ago. And the others who are talking about sheer governance and Gary Bess, a government of national unity, and all of them. It's hypocrisy. Gary Best was an advisor to President Granger. Where is his paper that he made public about shared governance? Nigel Hughes, who is talking about sharing the corn. Where is his proposal to the APNU AFC government over the last period to include the PPPC in governance? You know what they did? All of the things and the structures that were put in place 2001 after the constitutional reform process was concluded where we sought to build a more inclusive democracy chairing of parliamentary committees by opposition participation in the parliamentary management commi committee with equal numbers scrutiny by the legislative over the executive, including members, backbenchers of the government and members of the opposition. They destroyed all of that. Start putting ministers on committees. They, they, they create, recreated the balance of how do you, the numbers on the various committees. These people are not people that you could trust with shared governance. However, they didn't talk about it while they were in government. They didn't talk about it on the campaign trail. They didn't put it in their manifesto. Compare that to the PPPC's track record of inclusive government, consultation. While we were in government, every state board had PNC nominees. Before I became minister, I chaired state boards and they had PNC nominees. So I'm speaking from an informed position. Secondly, the parliamentary arrangements that we put in place, we honored them until 2015. In our manifesto that we went to the elections with, we were only party that highlighted in some detail our approach to inclusive 
democracy and inclusive governance. We spoke about how we will approach constitutional reform. We will consult with the people. It must be a people-driven process and not a few people who want to preserve power for themselves trying to tinker with something at the top. The people must say the kind of a government they want, how it must be shaped and how it must be fashioned. When we get in to office after those 13 containers of ballot boxes are counted, no matter how long Madam Claudette and Mr. Lowenfield takes, it will be counted. And the declaration will be made and Dr. Irfan Ali will become the next president. We will keep faith with the people of Guyana who elected us because what we said in our manifesto about inclusive governance and inclusive democracy, we will implement it. Look, we're not in government. Yes. The elections are over. We are waiting on the declaration and results and the swearing in of the next president so he could form his cabinet and get parliament going. We have a national emergency. Our presidential candidate, Dr. Irfan Ali, recognizes that the government's response to COVID-19 has been inadequate. They have not consulted with us. They have not included us even. He formed a stakeholders forum, not PPP people, all the political parties that contested, the private sector, religious bodies, trade unions, civil society groups, and people are making masks, distributing masks, bringing in food stuff, getting supplies to people, offering counseling, providing medical counseling by way of hotlines public education and information in the media, all of that is being done together, not by the PPPC, in the name of the PPPC. We have a track record of working with people and bringing everybody on board. When the election is done, it's done. When the election is over, it's over. I could live with those who made speeches and ridiculed each other on the election campaign and made jokes about people. But when an election is done and we have a country to run, we want all the skills. We want all the resources. We want all of our people. We want all the goodwill to ensure that Guyana prospers. Because when Guyana does well, all of us do well. And in order for Guyana to do well, all of us have to be doing well. So we are committed to inclusive democracy. We are committed to working with everyone. Barajad Dio, I recall in one of his press conferences, answering to a report and saying, the PNC has a constituency. I guess he deliberately didn't say the AFC because there was no AFC. <laughs> He said, the PNC has a constituency that you cannot ignore. The night after the passage of the no confidence motion in the parliament, Barajad Dio went over to Joseph Harmon, the time the minister of state, and said to him, we need to talk. We need to indicate to the president we need to talk on the way forward. That is the kind of magnanimous approach that we in the PPPC would always take when it comes to the nation. Not selfish grab for power, upmanship, showmanship. We want all the people to work. We have a history of when we are in government of hiring people who are our known political opponents. We made some ambassadors. Some got significant appointment in statutory bodies and boards. Because that's the nature you have skills. You have something to bring to the table. And we work with everyone. People like Eric Phillips. It was the government of Guyana that appointed Eric Phillips to be Guyana's lead person to, to be part of the Caribbean task force on the people uh, uh, in the decade of people of African descent. A known critic of the PPPC. We appointed him. We didn't, we didn't appoint a PPP Afro-Guyanese. 
because we believe that everybody have a contribution to make. And I could go on and on and on and name instances to show that we have the track record of working with everybody and bringing everybody on board. Okay, Bishop, thank you for being here today. I just want to make it clear that the PPPC's position on shared governance is that we are not going to engage in any talks until the recount is completed and the people, the people's will is respected by having their votes counted transparently and the government that they rightfully elected put into office. And we all know by now that the People's Progressive Party Civic won these 2020 elections. And so we're waiting for Madam Chairs from, of GCOM for her to give her final decision stating clearly how the recount will be conducted and to give that time frame as to when it's going to start and be completed so that you can have your government that you rightfully elected on March 2nd put into office to serve you. Bishop, thank you for being here. Viewers, thank you for tuning in. Goodbye.